What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the spinoff. Today, everybody, Husker Nation, anybody that knows Nebraska is going to know this name. Former black shirt, defensive end, number 98, Des Moines Adams. Thank you for joining me today. Hey, I appreciate you for having me. It's good that we can do this while it's warm and don't have to be outside in that negative 20 degree weather. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is, too. I, I looked at it just a little bit ago and with wind chill, I think it was like negative 22. And yeah, I'd much rather be inside doing this. Yes, sir. Well, you know, uh, it's nice to have the snow out there. You know, that's one of the things that actually brought me to Lincoln, but they didn't tell me anything about these temperatures. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, uh, it could always be worse somewhere else. It could be Minnesota. It could be Michigan, uh, North Dakota, even. I'm sure it gets way colder. So, uh, yeah. All right. So, I, I mean, we'll just start right into it, especially your early years coming up uh, in, uh, I believe it was Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Uh where did the journey to collegiate football start? Was it right there in Pine Bluff in high school? You know, honestly, as a kid, um, you know, played outside with my friends all the time, basketball, baseball, football, uh, played football in the streets, um, in any open field, you know, where we can just, just play. And so um, I would just say as a kid, we were all athletes. And as we got older, you know, we, we got into sports in middle school, high school, you know, I would say because of the video games, we always pictured ourselves maybe in the NBA, NFL, so to speak. Uh, but the reality as we got older, we realized it required so many other things. And so luckily I had a decent junior year to where I had some uh, camp offers, um, letters that came in the mail, but they were all pretty expensive, you know, things that um, my, my grandparents couldn't afford. Uh, so I ended up getting a, a job that summer just to save some money to go to this one camp that I could afford. It's the cheapest football camp, 150 bucks, and that was the University of Nebraska football camp. And so I would say that's where it started by me coming up this summer before my senior year, um, going through all of the testing, the 40 yard dash, the agility, the vertical jump, and then all of the different drills we did for three days. And that is what got Coach Osborne's attention. And lo and behold, I had a decent senior year, got the ACT score I needed, and I got that football um, scholarship offer in November of my senior year. Man, that, that's amazing. So uh, was Nebraska then your only scholarship offer though? You know, uh, my first scholarship offer was uh, Arkansas State. Um, and then from there, other smaller schools, uh, Baylor, Ole Miss. But once Nebraska was on the radar, once folks started hearing that Nebraska was recruiting this kid from Palm Bluff, Arkansas, of course, schools want players that other schools want. And Nebraska at the time, the number one um, D1 school in the nation, it was a no brainer. You know, this Des Moines Adams kid must be something if Nebraska wants him. And so my top five were, of course, Nebraska, Arkansas, Ole Miss, Baylor, and Missouri. Uh, but it was a no-brainer. You know, I um, hate to say it, growing up in the South, I really wasn't exposed to Nebraska growing up. But once I came to the camp, saw the tradition, the championships, the weight room, and – they dominated every single team they played in 1997. It was a no-brainer who I was going to um, for college. So in high school, normally mo most kids play Ironman football, play both sides of the ball. Is that something sure. you did as well? And if so, what was your position <laughs> on offense? Yes, sir. So uh, I did it all. Um, I played tight end, defensive end, linebacker. Of course, kickoff, kickoff return, uh, did it all. You know, honestly, uh, my favorite my favorite position was running back. So uh, up until middle school, um, I, I played running back because I had a little speed and, you know, because I was a little taller and a little bigger, I could run people over. But they ended up uh, moving me from running back to the defensive side, which is cool because, of course, the running backs in high school definitely had more skill, more agility. Um, but I'm thankful that they moved me because that same tenacity that I had 
trying to play running back ended up helping me at linebacker, at defensive end. And as they say, speed kills. I didn't, I didn't realize it at the time how uh, just, just that, that, that skill set of just being able to outrun people or the quickness, but uh, it actually gave me an advantage and that advantage helped me to get to the quarterback, helped me to get recognized uh, statewide and um, just thankful that it got the attention of other schools across the country, including Nebraska. So seeing how you obviously enjoyed playing the offensive side of the ball, it, but being moved to the defensive side permanently, what was it that hooked you to that side of the ball? Was it laying somebody out knowing you're not going to get in trouble for it? <laughs> so um, they, they they put me eventually a defensive end, I would say my junior year. And honestly, uh, I wasn't a big fan. You know, I, of course, the linebacker position, being able to stand up and kind of see everything, uh, being able to put my hand down, I wasn't a big fan. Uh, but how quick I got to the quarterback, how I just dominated the edge, uh, I would say uh, that kind of turned me on. And from that moment, uh, I realized that my success was being on an edge. And eventually I just took ownership of being that defensive end. Of course, in high school, I was considered, you know, somewhat big. I was maybe <laughs> 6'3", 215, 220. Um, and um, just the results that I got playing defensive end, um, you know, I felt good. And Nebraska actually recruited me to play defensive end or a linebacker, or I would say both, because when I went to the camp, uh, Craig Bowe, who was the yep. linebacker's coach at the time, he had me going through his drills. And um, um, Nelson Barnes, who was the defensive end coach at the time, had me going through his drills. So, you know, I was going through both drills, but when it came down to it, uh, Coach Osborne really saw me uh, bringing that speed to that rush in position, which back in the day, that's what they called defensive ends were rush ins because it was all about getting that rush to their quarterback. And see, it's funny that you bring that up about Coach Osborne. It, it, does it seem like he just had a knack for knowing where somebody is needed, where they're most useful, no matter if it's completely opposite position? Did it seem like he just had the knack for being able to place somebody in the right spot? He did. You know, I don't think players realized it at the time. He recruited a lot of players who played running back or quarterback in high school, but he moved them to defensive back or safety, like Joe Walker, for example. Uh, he was an offensive star in offense. Uh, was it the same with Mike Minner as well? Exactly. Uh, Keo Craver, who was an all-state yeah. all running back, ended up turning into an all-American defensive back. And so um, I would say over the years, his experience, um, understanding – the need for speed on defense and uh, players willing to make that sacrifice, it truly made a difference. And uh, I'm, I'm just grateful that he saw something that I didn't see at the time when I first came up here, I'm around all of these bigger, taller defensive ends, your uh, Chad Kelsey, your Kyle Vandenbosch. Um, and, you know, it was easy for me to focus on my weaknesses. The fact that I wasn't as tall, I wasn't as big, but once I realized why I was recruited and once I took ownership of my strengths, which was speed, strength, um, that's when I began to excel. And um, yeah, Tom Osborne, he knew exactly how to recruit, knew exactly what was needed for Nebraska to get the job won. So your senior year in high school, then who was it that really led the charge for your recruiting process as far as making the contacts, sending video out. Who was it that really spearheaded that and led the charge for you there? <laughs> so high school, you know, uh, we didn't have uh, all of this uh, technology uh, <laughs> like your, uh, what, what do you call these uh, videos? Man, I'm drawing a blank. Um, Just highlight reels anymore is what they are. Yeah, so you had two VCRs, and so you had to get, <laughs> game tape you had to get a blank tape and you pretty much had to record those clips and stuff you had to send it out uh luckily you know um i just wanted an opportunity 
you know, I honestly wasn't a four star, five star high school player. I was maybe one star, two star, to be honest. And I believe because I had a decent junior year, you know, statewide, you know, that put me in the category of being a premise and, you know, senior that, you know, could, you know, get some shine. Um, and so it put me in the spotlight. And so I was just thankful to get recruited, you know, to have an opportunity, regardless if it was Arkansas State, Missouri, Ole Miss, Baylor, those are great opportunities, especially being a first generation student. Uh, but coming to Nebraska's football camp, that was the game changer. And although I did send out a couple of videos to some other schools that, you know, growing up in the South, you know, I, I checked out Florida State. So they were one of the schools, Florida, your, your Notre Dame, but I didn't get that love back. Nebraska showed me love the entire way. Turner Gill kept his eyes on me because that was his territory. Um, and uh, because I had a good senior year, uh, that just gave Coach Osborne that confirmation. And so I got that phone call in November with Coach Osborne offering me that full ride scholarship. Man, that's amazing. I can't even imagine what that feeling must be like getting that offer, knowing that it, your school is covered. I mean, as long as you just keep your nose clean, yeah. keep your grades up, do what they expect out of you on the field. That has to be an amazing feeling, knowing that your collegiate career is financially taken care of. It was. And, you know, of course, I'm thankful for the mentors that I had in my life, um, great teachers, high school counselor, um, all folks that, that were rooting for me, um, not just uh, athletically, but academically, because there were so many other players growing up that were better than me, that were faster, stronger. Um, you know, Pine Bluff, uh, I would say, is a place where it has so much talent. Um, but I'm thankful for the academic side because if it wasn't for that ACT score, um, Nebraska would have never happened. Or having a certain GPA or just keeping my nose clean by not doing drugs and doing other things that were tempting. Uh, grateful for the people that were looking over me that had my back, that were rooting for me, cheering for me, but also helping me to understand what I needed to do to get to the, to get to the next level. So definitely can't take full credit for getting to Nebraska and the, and all of the success that I achieved. Uh, it definitely took that, that village and my family, mom and dad and uh, everyone else that, that really supported me um, full circle. So then would it be fair to say that, that I guess the X factor, the, the, the thing that sealed the deal was getting that scholarship offer then that was it, Nebraska's it. <laughs> You know, Nebraska was definitely my number one. Uh, once I left that football camp, I was, uh, I was convinced my senior year, I had to go back and I had to kill it. And I, I needed to dominate every single game. Uh, you know, what's funny is um, when I went to the Nebraska football camp, that was the first time that I actually shaved my head because here I am going to a place, I'm, I'm the only player from my school that's making a sacrifice to go to this foreign land called Lincoln, Nebraska. And so, <laughs> you know, um, I wanted to have this tough appearance. And so I shaved my head, you know, so I can come up here and, uh, and, and just look like I'm this tough kid from Pine Bluff. And then when I came back, um, you know, my, my mindset was different. But then also I had a lot of friends that, you know, they thought it was pretty cool that, you know, oh, you know, I like the ball head. And so that's when I stuck with the ball head. And uh, since what, 16, 17 years old, this has been a look. And so uh, some folks like my kids, they like to say, daddy, you know, uh, you're ball headed. And I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm ball by choice, not, not because of my age. And so, um, you know, I made this look not just a tough look, but it became the look for me. And then again, Nebraska, I was just convinced that that was a school that I saw myself being. And so all of the hard work that I put in on the field and off the field, that's what sealed the deal. But off the field definitely was more important than on the field because if I didn't get that ACT, get those grades, 
Uh, if I was getting into a ton of trouble, Nebraska would have never gave me that scholarship because Nebraska, they're all about not only bringing talent, but strong character, leadership. And those are some of the other things that I'm very thankful that they developed during my time at Nebraska. And see, it's funny that you you brought up the the bald head look. It, it, <laughs> Husker fans kind of, I believe it's been brought up that, isn't that kind of a tradition for black shirts? May, some of them, may, maybe back in the day and in your time, might not be so much now. But I, I know back then, there were, there were some players that shaved their head because it felt like a tradition on the defensive side. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but uh, it just <laughs> definitely gives you this 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 tough spirit. Um, you know, I wasn't around when uh, Grant and Jason was here, but I think there, there were periods when they, they shaved their head. A lot of the defense alignment, um, for sure, seemed like that was the trend for defense alignment. Um, <laughs> but for me, it was just a natural. I kept a look. I don't think Chris Kelsey ever shaved his head. I may have to get on him about that. But Chad Kelsey definitely did. But Chris, you know, Chris was definitely a tough, pretty boy. <laughs> Chris Kelsey, that's my guy. You know, we both came in at the same time. Um, Chad was a senior. We were both freshmen. Uh, Chris still to this day, good friends. Um, you know, had a very successful uh, career at Nebraska and then after Nebraska, playing for the Bills for 10 years, being a captain, leader. And if you look at him today, he still got it. I'm like, wow, you know, we can still go out there and do some damage. And so uh, it was good to see him um, in 2020. Um, you know, he got his degree from the College of Business. That's part of my work now through the University of Nebraska Foundation is to support the College of Business. So we were able to connect brought them back to, you know, to show others that there are a lot of Huskers that are taking care of business after sports. And so, um, you know, it's just uh, something that, you know, being a former Husker uh, not only helped me to have somewhat of a platform today, but the skills, um, the networking, the teamwork, the, the resiliency, the determination has really helped me to be a winner in life. And guys like Chris Kelsey and so many other players were winners in life because the game of football taught us what it took to be a winner. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. That's, I mean, I did sports almost my entire life, uh, especially through high school. And I'll tell you what, it helped immensely as to how it shaped me in character and as a, a human being just in general. So, yeah. It's an amazing feeling, and, and you guys hit it right on the head. That's exactly what sports is. It's uh, it's a way to shape young minds, and to shape them the right way, you guys are doing the right thing, absolutely. So describe the feeling, what it was like. We, you're already on campus, football season's here, your freshman year. What was that feeling like, the very first tunnel walk? I got to know. Is it just uh, goosebumps on goosebumps? You know, uh, for one, back in the day, the tunnel walk was South Stadium. And yep. so, of course, you, you had those 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 bricks that you had to walk on. And so I was making sure that I didn't slip. You know, <laughs> you got the tunnel walk, you got the fans that are going crazy. I'm trying to make sure that that I don't slip and fall. But the moment when we ran out of the tunnel walk into the field was breathtaking mm. hearing over 80,000 fans just screaming. Like it literally put me in this zone to where for some reason I heard everything. I didn't hear anything. It was kind of like the twilight zone. I mean, it was <laughs> one of the most amazing feelings that, um, yeah, that, that I ever felt just running out and just all of that energy, all of that red, talk about the best fans in the country. Um, the experience of being on the field and then when I actually got to play and getting a sack and just seeing everybody throw up the bones, you know, <laughs> the fans, you know, definitely make that experience great. Um, very unfortunate that, you know, this past season due to COVID, uh, the fans um, couldn't make that experience great for the players, but 
that tunnel walk is nothing without the fans. I tell you that the fans make the tunnel walk. I'll tell you, I can remember when they unveiled that for the 94 season. Uh, I was pretty young at the time, I think 12. And my gosh, first game, home game I went to that they used that. I mean, I, I don't think I had hair on my arms yet, but whatever mm -hmm. there was there, it was standing up. That's for sure. All right. So I, I, going through I, I, your career, I mean, I've got to bring this up because it, it, it's just a staple on Nebraska football history. The 2001 game against Colorado. I mean, unfortunately, I've got to I've got to bring it up. A lot yeah, of folks yeah. say that the defense just was never the same since that game. Um, it, it seems like in, in some forms, maybe it's not. But I mean, can you kind of take me through the feelings after that game? You know, uh, to be honest, the game before it end was was K-State. We beat them at home. Our site was really Big 12 championship. Colorado did not have a good record. We just didn't see them as, you know, a contender or, you know, even, you know, someone who could compete with us. Uh, we prepare for them just like any other game, but our site was really Big 12 championship, national championship. For some reason, Colorado shocked us and at the end, that next week we had to sit back and just watch everybody else play and wait because we were out of the big 12 championship. So that's the one thing that, that, that really just shocked us. We were the number one team, Colorado beat us. And just like that, we were out of big 12. And so now we're trying to see if we can get back to number two, because that put us back to number four. And so that feeling after that Colorado game, we were shocked. We couldn't believe it. But to be completely honest, we didn't focus on Colorado. We were already focusing on the Big 12 championship. And I think that's one of the mistakes uh, I would say that we made as a defense was that we were not prepared uh, for what, what Colorado was going to bring us. Um, and so uh, we're thankful that we ended up getting into the national championship. And of course, we, we fell short against Miami. Uh, but still to this day, I believe that we had a great team. Yeah. Um, Jamie Burrow was our um, Mike linebacker, Dewan Gross, All American, Keo Craver, All American, Chris Kelsey on the other side, Scott Shanley. We had so many weapons. And let's not forget about our Heisman Trophy winner, Eric Crouch. We definitely had a team that um, definitely um, deserved to be in a national championship, but we fell short at, at Colorado simply because we already had our sight on Big 12. So was there any sort of uh, speech or message that Coach Solich or Coach Bull gave you guys in the locker room immediately after the game, or was there really anything that could be said at that moment? You know, we were speechless. You know, um, to we be were honest, his fans too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Craig Bowl was just as fiery as uh, Frank Selich. Um, so I do remember Craig Bowl gave it to us. It was a long flight home. And, and, and of course, we just didn't have any answers. How did the number one team in the country lose against a team like Colorado, who clearly didn't have a record? And because of that loss, put us out of the Big 12. So to be completely honest, that ride home, coaches didn't want to hear anybody talking, laughing, joking around. They wanted the dead silence. We didn't even deserve to have any fun. And to be honest, um, I completely respected that because that game knocked us out of Big 12, the championship, and potentially the national championship. So that is what it, Looked like, felt like coming home from Colorado, completely silence. That's what the coaches wanted. Oh, boy. I, I've had that feeling before, and it's not good. I've been married almost 18 years. I've had that feeling before. It's not good. <laughs> uh, All right, so we'll, we'll wind down your career at Nebraska. Uh, one last question on it. What is going to be the one lasting memory you have from your time at Nebraska? Oh, you know, I tell people this all of the time. 
that 1999 season, I was a redshirt freshman, fourth <laughs> quarter. It was a night game against Iowa State. Mm. Um, got in, got in fourth quarter. Charlie McBride, defensive coordinator, I always loved calling this play to where I'm the end at the time. Joe Walker, he kind of comes up. And so it was my job to distract the tackle so Joe Walker can pretty much get to the quarterback. I didn't like to play personally because <laughs> guess who got the glory? It was always <laughs> that safety or defensive back that would get up. It, it was a great design play because I distract the tackle, Joe Walker goes, and then it's my responsibility to go behind him. So lo and behold, we both did our part and Joe sacks the quarterback, quarterback fumbles the ball, and guess who's there to pick it up? Des Moines Adams on 98. <laughs> so I picked up that ball. And again, the fans, just, just the hype. For some reason, it got completely silent. Like, I blanked out. All I knew was I picked up the ball and I started running. I felt people trying to tackle me and stuff. And I, I see the end zone. And I'm trying to give everything I have in my body to get to that end zone. And once I got there... It was about 38 yards. I was completely out of breath. I couldn't think about spiking the ball. I couldn't think about celebrating. I was I was just excited, blown away that, wow, did this just really happen? And then to go to the sideline and, and to get all of the love that I got from the players, the coaches, you know, it's actually on YouTube, you know, it's a Demo Touchdown because that moment right there, Oh, and it was actually on ESPN top 10 that night too. So for the entire country, Pine Bluff, all my friends and families to, to check that out, the Moen Adams scoring that touchdown was one of the coolest, best moments for me at Nebraska. Oh, I can guarantee when this when I put this video out here in a week or so, it, it the comments are probably gonna say, Hey, I remember watching that too, or Somebody's going to say they've pulled that up and watched it numerous times. <laughs> so I guarantee a lot of fans remember that as well. So it obviously it's amazing that that sticks with you because that stuck with fans just as much. It's oh, yeah. great. It's great to share those memories with you guys. So that's, I think that's how we feel that connection to the program, the university, the players, everybody. So we thank you guys just as much as you guys thank us. It, it you guys couldn't do it without us. We could obviously couldn't be fans without you guys. So, oh yeah, you, you know, um, again, when they say Nebraska has the best fans, I I, I truly believe it because even the away games, uh, my folks living in Arkansas, Texas, anytime we would play Baylor or Texas A and M or Texas, they just could not believe all of the red that was in the stands. Um, so it was a great experience, definitely. The fans made the game special and um, truly thankful, grateful, even to this day for fans still to remember this, this uh, older um, <laughs> human being, uh, you know, to still actually remind me of certain games that they remember when we went to Notre Dame and uh, other, um, you know, just moments that I, I forgot about because when we're on the field, you know, it's really not about smelling the roses. You make a play, you give, you get back in the huddle, and you got, got to keep bringing it every single down. And so, um, you know, I would say my time doing Nebraska, um, I didn't get to smell the roses a whole lot because, you know, our model was day by day. We get better and better. And so uh, it was never a moment to get content. Once we finish that game on Saturday, we're back to work on Monday. And so uh, as much as we put in that hard work on the field, uh, just truly grateful for the fans um, who just would always ride and die for us. Because uh, even when we were down, uh, they never quit, never gave up on us. And, and so that truly made my experience at Nebraska very special. And we can't thank you enough for it, that's for sure. All right. Uh, after your career here at Nebraska, you played in the Canadian Football League. So how did that come about? And what was it like playing in the Canadian Football League? There were a few different rules and a little bit longer field, a little bit wider. It's fun to watch. It's exciting. Yeah. 
So how did that come about? You know, to be completely honest, it came about because I didn't get drafted. And uh, not getting drafted, you know, um, it was pretty embarrassing. It was pretty, um, I would say, heartbroken, I guess, more personally. Um, could have still went out to try to get on the team as a free agent, but not getting drafted after a successful junior year, leading the team in sacks, being an academic All-American, um, it hurt. And so um, I decided just to go back to school. I was in graduate school at the time. And then in the spring of 2004, I still had that itch. I, I, I still felt like I could give it a shot. You know, I'm seeing all of my friends on TV doing their thing, Chris Kelsey, Keo, DeWan. Um, and so immediately I started putting myself back out there, going to different tryouts and um, getting told no, or we'll get back to you. And the team that actually said, we'll give you a shot were the Edmonton Eskimos. And so I knew I needed to get in where I can fit in by getting that experience. And so that's when I got this shot to go up to Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, it was a sacrifice, of course, but it was a sacrifice that I was willing to make in order to get to that next level, which was the NFL. But what an incredible experience because uh, living in Edmonton, Alberta, different, de definitely a different culture, but a lot of fun, lots of donuts. Um, you know, uh, training camp, I would say at the time was around May or June. I would never forget that the sunset was like around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. And then the sunrise was like at 5, 6 a.m. So it was hard to get any sleep during training camp but it was an amazing experience uh, you know um, I would say by the time the season got to October November talk about negative degree weather right now in Lincoln Nebraska the ground was so frozen oh. we didn't even wear cleats we had to simply wear tennis shoes with a little stub because the frown the, the ground was frozen um but it was an incredible experience. Played up there for a year and a half. Uh, Patrick Cabon uh, Cabongo, former player, yeah. he ended up being with the Edmonton Eskimos. Keo Craver was on the team as well. Um, and so uh, it was a, a great experience. That's how I got up there. Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity because even though I was trying out for a chance to get into the NFL, Edmonton Eskimos gave me that shot and uh, not only just the experience of playing for the Eskimos, but having the experience to live in another country, um, it was pretty cool. Yeah, that's amazing. All right, so we'll, we'll go ahead. We'll, we'll move past that. This is something I really wanted to talk to you about. Look this up on you, man. Everything I read about this is great, but I want you to explain this to everybody out of your own, out of your mouth with your own words. The game plan. You're a motivational speaker and an artist. How did the game plan come about? What is it? And when did it start? You know, when the dreams that love in me, uh, you know, from Edmonton, I had an opportunity to play for the Packers and that didn't go through. Had an opportunity to play with the Titans and then eventually they didn't go through the way that I wanted. Did arena football, 49ers, more arena football. And then in 2008, I realized, you know, this is affecting my ego, my confidence. I'm, I'm making teams, I'm, I'm getting cut. And uh, that's when I made the decision that at 28 years of age, maybe it's time to get a real job. And so in the process of, you know, trying to get the real job, I got two degrees and I'm very thankful that the University of Nebraska gave me my first job. But uh, Aaron Davis, also a motivational speaker, former Husker player, asked me this question. You know, if you could do something for the rest of your life and get paid for it, what would it do? I mean, what would it be? And I thought about it. And I was very involved with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes when I was in Nebraska and just being able to go out, speak to kids, share my testimony. Uh, I was pretty comfortable getting in front of people, motivating them, inspiring them. So I told him, you know, I wouldn't mind doing what you're doing to be a motivational speaker. And so that's when he helped me with 
putting together a game plan in terms of, okay, what will you talk about? What, what can you give? And it made sense, you know, with all of the years that I played the game of football, what better way to help people to be winners in this game called life? How to demonstrate your leadership, what teamwork looks like, what it means to be resilient, what it means to work hard and everything that we learned. I put all of that together to help fill that bucket because after football, that bucket was empty. And I had two degrees, but yet when you play football your whole life for a lot of players, we leave the game feeling like there's something that's missing. And so I'm thankful that Aaron Davis helped me to figure out, you know, what I could do with everything that I learned from the game of football and turn it into this thing called the game plan to help people to have a game plan to be winners in life, whether it's in the workplace, in school, at home, we all need a game plan. And so that's where it started in 2008. And here we are in 2021. And I feel like I'm just getting started. And so from mentors like Aaron Davis, from the experience and opportunities that I've had to speak, not only across the state, but across the country, uh, it's been a great way for me to fill that bucket, especially from all of those years of putting everything I had into the game of football. That's amazing. So do you, do you feel like you get the same uh, amount of, I guess, uh, fulfillment as you did playing football doing this with the game plan? I do. I do. Because I feel like I'm making a difference. I feel that not only Nebraska, but all of the other teams that, that I played with, uh, the time, the energy, the amount of work that we put into prepping for that one moment, that one game. You know, talk about day by day. I mean, day by day, we have to uh, have this 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 mindset to to compete. But after sports, I learned that the competition was never the other team. The competition was always that person that we looked at in the mirror every single day. Every single day, I was competing against me. You know, effort over excuses. Am I going to focus on my strengths or my weaknesses? Am I going to focus on what I can do or what I can do? Can I have that short term memory? Can I be resilient? Um, and so that that competitive mindset is what I love to give to others and to inspire others to be winners, uh, to motivate others um, from feeling like they can't and helping them to feel like that they can helping them to understand what it takes to be a winner because you still may have setbacks. And, you know, I always like to say, you know, the game of life is just like the game of football. Sometimes life will knock you down. Life will tackle you. Life will hit you and you're either going to quit or you're going to get back up. And so winners never quit and quitters never win. And so to be able to help people understand what we had to understand as a football player, it's amazing to be able to get in, uh, get in front of, of a group of people. Of course, this is what we're doing now in terms of Zooming, but helping people understand exactly what it takes to be winners and what they do. And that's powerful. And I feel like I'm making a positive difference. I uh, feel like I definitely gave Nebraska, the state of Nebraska, everything that, that I could possibly give them when I was a player but to give so many other people, thousands of people, uh, what they truly need every single day um, to feel like a winner, to be a winner and what they're doing. Um, that's priceless, man. Good morning. I got to tell you, this, this has been one heck of an interview, my friend. This, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, that, that, I mean, as far as the questions go, it, man, I couldn't have asked for any better of answers on all, <laughs> all forms. So what I'll do is what I do in every episode. I'm going to turn the platform over to you quick. You can let people know where to find you, any other charities or organizations you would like to throw out there that folks may not know about. In other words, right now the platform is yours, sir. Let everybody know what's going on. Well, again, you know, Des Moines Adams, I'm, I'm on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, 
nothing cool is just Des Moines Adams. You got to capitalize the M all together. Definitely check me out. I'm always putting up motivational quotes, things that, that keep us inspired, give us hope, especially during these uncertain times. And so definitely follow me, like me, um, and you will continue to uh, have a game plan um, every single day. Um, also, what I'm doing today, I work at the University of Nebraska Foundation. It's, it's, it's a great feeling to be able to give back to my alma mater. Uh, by securing resources for the university, by connecting alum back to the university to help them to have a legacy similar to Coach Osborne's legacy, which is the teammates mentoring program, which I worked for for almost eight years. It was great to not only get recruited to play for the Huskers by him, but to get recruited to play for the teammates mentoring organization. I feel like I got recruited twice and teammates, uh, again, a great organization, something that he's very passionate about to help um, adults to use their role to be role models for our youth by meeting with them once a week at the school during the school day uh, is uh, an incredible, uh, incredible way to, to make a positive difference. And so uh, I'm definitely a, an advocate, a huge fan of the teammates mentoring program, but also for the last year I've been working at the University of Nebraska Foundation, which is an incredible way to continue to create scholarships to help the university ha to have what they need to provide students with a quality education. But then also on the side, which is, I feel like my purpose, my calling, and that's the motivation of speaking through what I've built up called the game plan, ready, set, perform, and so all of that information can be found on my social media. Also, you can check out my website at www.demoin-adams.com. Uh, I'm also very involved with uh, the Boys and Girls Club of Lincoln and so many other things, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, uh, Salvation Army, uh, anything that I can do by giving my time to, to make a positive difference, that's simply what I've been doing. But of course, you know, my family, um, every single day, I focus on three things, um, work, life, family balance, um, and just very grateful, you know, to just have the opportunity to make a positive difference, whether it's through the University of Nebraska Foundation, whether it's through my motivation of speaking, whether it's serving on boards or being a mentor through the teammates mentoring program, uh, Tom Osborne, as he gets ready to um, turn another page in this chapter in terms of his birthday, he is definitely someone that has believed in me, uh, someone that, that, that I, I look up to. And his legacy, what I've learned, is not what he achieved on the field, but is what he has achieved off the field through teammates. He is someone that I would like to, to, to model uh, one day, because I want to be remembered not only just as a Husker football player, I want to be remembered as someone who who made a difference because when that day comes and, and they're sharing all of the accomplishments and achievements of Des Moines Adams, uh, I want people to talk about how I made them feel the difference that I made, how I took every single blessing and skill set and strength, and I made a difference with that platform in a positive way. And so that's Des Moines Adams. Again, find me, like me, follow me on social media so that you can continue to, to be inspired and know what it takes day by day to be a winner in everything that you do. I'll tell you, you're definitely not short of people that find you, follow you, and, and like you. Trust me, there, there is quite the abundance of folks to do still. So Des Moines, I'm going to close this out. I can't thank you enough. Uh, guys, you're going to be able to find this on YouTube, of course. It's under my name, Brian Knudsen, of course, the spinoff. Uh, you'll be able to find the audio. It, it'll be on Apple Podcasts. Uh, I believe we are, might be on Sirius Podcasts now. Uh, Amazon uh, Music, I believe we're on as well. You'll be able to find that at the Scarlet and Cream Husker Podcast. You'll be able to find us on Twitter, at the Scarlet Cream. Myself, at Knudsen underscore Brian. Find me on Facebook, at Brian Knudsen. 
where I'll be posting uh, links to all the videos. And everybody, thank you so much for the support. Can't thank you enough. Des Moines Adams, thank you so much for joining me today, and I hope to have you on again soon. Maybe we'll have a black shirt roundtable. All right. I will love it. Again, thank you for the opportunity. Go Big Red. And um, again, continue to do big things by giving the fans what they want, which is to, to, to hear the real story behind the glory of Husker football. I could not have said that better myself. That might be the greatest sign-off I've had so far. <laughs> DeWine, thank you so much. I'll log this off. We'll get it going, and we'll talk again soon. All right, sounds good. Thank you again. Thank you.